and welcome back to part two of our fresh warrior run focused attacks only uh, back at our gear we have both bitter end and devil's nail for physical damage the twinter fang for blunt magic damage and the dwells in light for holy damage uh, we're wearing the entire immortal set that is going to be our healing for this run to keep us alive because we will take a lot of hits we do not have any iframe abilities going over those abilities which we'll get to in a moment with this character oh actually let's go over the rings first uh, for the most part we just have the barbed nails and then we have the two uh, warrior rings for indomitable lash and uh, arc of deliverance upgrades so savage lash and arc of obliteration and a ring of desiccation abilities Obviously, Indomitable Lash, Arc of Deliverance. We also have Active Vengeance. We don't use it at all because it's kind of bad without certain setups. And then, Augments-wise, fairly standard stuff. Bastion for defense, but we have Acuity for increased magic damage. The rest is Impact for Stagger, Autonomy for Strength and Defense, and Clout for Strength. Resuming the run. The Rotwood Depository. There's the Skeleton Knights spawning in, the Silver Knight, so we can tell it's ghosts. We're going to run this way down the hall to make the ghosts spawn here. And we're going to hit it with Dwells and Light. This is a very consistent uh, method of dealing with these guys. Generally, I don't get grabbed, but it's also a little bit surprising that the uh, Silver Knight there casted a healing spell at the Ghost instead of a debilitation spell at me. Very rarely will he start with a healing spell. It's considerably more likely that he starts with a debilitation. Um, so that kind of caught me off guard, and then it obviously grabbed me. As my plan was to dodge out of the way so the debilitation cloud wasn't on top of the ghost so I'd be able to hit it, but then he cast a different spell and it, I didn't know what to do about it. But that's okay. As you can already see, our health is creeping back up with the immortal set. So it's not going to be critical. <laughs> Now we're going to switch to the Devil's Nail for the bludgeoning damage. We'll also probably put on Arc of Obliteration ring, because we can one-shot them with an Arc of Obliteration. Uh, if we use Arc of Deliverance, we leave just a tiny sliver of health. If you watched my first phase, or my first uh, video, part one, you'll note that I don't really care for uh, using Arc of in a lot of circumstances. The move I think is the most, if not, you know, it's certainly one of the most satisfying abilities that successfully used in the game. But its damage is only sometimes alright. A lot of times you can do other things for the same amount of damage within the time that you could get off the arc of, but you don't have to uh, worry about um, being vulnerable. There I started climbing up that ladder because for whatever reason I forgot that we had snakes in here and I was thinking we had the goblin shamans, but that is on the Saurian configuration. Here I'm going to try and kill the vile eyes quickly. Um, after that we will typically deal with the ghost because the Silver Knight isn't really a threat to us. He just kind of casts Torpors and then heals. And we can kind of just kill him whenever we want. He's actually more dangerous when you go over to attack him because then he'll actually hit you with uh, melee attacks, in fact. Um, here we have the ghost on our head. I don't really care about it. By that, I mean, it's not really preventing me from doing anything. If you look at our health, it's actually ticking down to 19 and going up to 20. Uh, 
so it's not really a big deal. I don't, I also don't care that it's getting its health back from the healing that the Silver Knight is creating. It just doesn't really matter. There we got the skeleton off, not because of the, or not the skeleton, the wraith off, not because of the obliteration, but because we hit that fire barrel, the explosive barrel. If we had just done the arc of and not hit it, it wouldn't have knocked it off. But we don't really care, frankly. It doesn't matter. There's another explosive barrel in the corner. Also, if we run backwards through the level, uh, back to the room where we killed those snakes, the ghosts will often pop off of our head. And by often, I mean almost always pop off of our head by the time we move up the ramp. And that's it. Now, the next room has two phantoms and a living armor. We also have the potential to have an Elder Ogre spawn in there. I wasn't sure if we killed one or two on that first swing, so I'm happy <laughs> I'm happy I knew while playing the game, because I definitely did not uh, <laughs> while watching it just now. Would have been awkward to have to wait for it again. But we can have an Elder Ogre. Um, I don't want to fight this guy in this room. I want to get past him so I can attempt to spawn in the Elder Ogre so I can beat it up without having to fight both at the same time. But he's being very uh, persistent, I'll say. There we go. And that's what we were looking for. There's our other ogre spawn. So the living armor can climb up to this platform that we're standing on, but he doesn't very often. And when he does, he often turns around after like his first attack and leaves. And then he won't come back in and sweep close. So we typically will have the opportunity to beat up the elder ogre without interference from the living arm. And as of right now, like, it looks like the living arm can follow us. So, that is holding true. Thus far. And this is what we were hoping for, frankly. Just to beat up the Elder Ogre solo. I was going to say, generally I'll use Bitter End. I don't actually think that the hammer is better. I think it's weaker to slash than it is bludgeoning. But I wouldn't really know. I'd have to look it up. There we took a hit. Um, our stagger resistance apparently is good enough, but it doesn't really matter. We took a drop kick to the face and didn't even interrupt our swing. That's cool. While we were airborne. Usually if you get hit by something while airborne, it'll knock you out really... knock you down really easily. But the... Uh, Immortal sets, pretty pretty good, pretty good defenses. That's part of why we go for it. It's got good defenses and it has the healing. We would need both just to eliminate the size of some of the hits that we take. We also do have Bastion Augment, like I said before, which greatly reduces physical damage. It's not quite the uh, Sanctuary Augment when you're low health, but honestly quite good. Okay. Next we should switch back to the Devil, Devil's Nail for the hammer, bludgeoning damage. Uh, and then for phase two of the Living Armor, we'll use the Twinter Fang because we need magic damage. And we want it to be bludgeoning. He still takes increased damage from bludgeoning, despite no longer having armor. <laughs> and 
unfortunately, the methods for fighting a living armor as a warrior is largely one of hit and run, mostly run, <laughs> and uh, it's not a satisfying attack. Like, we never get any of our other attacks off. Which is true for a lot of fights, but living armor is just... I don't know whether we were full health before that swing, but like we're missing 800 health now. So, we aren't going to do great damage with magic, because we don't have that much damage with magic, frankly. Um, we just lost like another 800 health on that single swing, by the way. It was still dangerous, even with the Bastion Augment. But uh, anyway, um, if we were using the Dwells in Light, we would be losing even more health. Now, if we had killed the Ur-Dragon and gotten the Angel's Fist, which is the bludgeoning weapon, we might have just stuck with that instead of having both weapons in our inventory. But realistically, it probably is better for us to have the Twinter Fang, because the Twinter Fang just has a higher amount of stat than either Dwells in Light or... Uh, Angel's Fist, I'm pretty sure. Damn. Yeah, okay. But, uh... The difference is probably fairly minimal in in the grand scheme of our damage uh, profile against this guy. We just have so much strength leveling up 190 levels of warrior and 10 levels of fighter. So it's it's uh, our magic stats pretty pretty negligible. It's like I don't I don't know if it would actually change the amount of damage we do in any tangible way. So long as we still have them. it's like a thirty percent bonus for using bludgeoning on this guy. So if we got rid of that, we'd probably be sad. But since we get to keep it, we're pretty okay. This guy's liking the uh, stone grove ability. Which is okay. Now, if we had Exodus Slash, you can actually iframe the Stone Grove attack itself. So you can just stay right on him. You get a lot more hits in. It's uh, obviously just a DPS increase by virtue of the fact that you don't have to run away and then re uh, run back in. You can just stay on him, time your Exodus Slash with the explosion, and then continue. Uh, it's actually not that difficult, frankly. Um, any iframe ability will do it, so you can do it full moon slash, dragon's maw, exit slash, obviously. Uh, you probably can do it with forward roll. I have a hard time doing it with forward roll because I will roll into another shockwave of it. Um, but I'm sure there's a timing you can do it on. I'd be very surprised to find out that there is. Or like an angle you could roll, maybe if you roll like more sideways than forward. I don't know. Maybe if you position behind him, but to one side, and you roll to the other side from behind him. I don't know. But either way, it's, it's the timing is actually not that delicate. It's quite approachable. I am surprised we were far enough behind him to hit there. All in all, not the worst fight. We did lose. Right now, we're about a thousand health shy, but we did lose probably closer to. Uh, we lost closer to like three thousand or three times that uh, during that fight, just because I think we got hit four times. I think the lowest point I saw was like twenty something hundred health, but you got to remember that during that entire fight we were regening health, and after that point we regened over a thousand health, so it's not bad. Um, I shouldn't be as concerned here. So we have death. Death spawns in the configuration that has liches and hellhounds. I don't remember if the hellhounds spawn on the left when death is here. They might, and that's what I'm kind of being cautious about. I would say, but we're not really afraid of death. Death is pretty easy. We could actually run in there and have him put the hellhounds to sleep if we wanted to. And that's, I guess they do spawn. Though we have sleep resistance, as we saw earlier. 
So as long as he's not doing a side attack, we can actually just let him put the Hellhounds to sleep. Now, he keeps using the side attack, even though he doesn't know where near us. Um, so I'm not really sure what's going on. But either way, Hellhound's dead. There's a good reason I was afraid of them. Now we'll just have to load Death down. So, Hell, uh, Hellhound. Uh, Death, when he spawns into the room immediately, he takes the place of the two liches that were up top, or in the room earlier. So, Death, while slow and kind of annoying for us to hit, um, it's actually probably a bit more active and enjoyable fight to partake in than the liches would be, simply by virtue of the fact that we get to hit them. Or sorry, we get to hit death, whereas against the liches, we kind of don't, simply because they keep flying up out of our range. We have to like wait out certain attacks, they drop their pustules on the ground, which also aren't fun. With death, you know, we have 100% sleep resistance, so we can just wail on this guy. Even if we didn't, we would just have to back off and then we can go back in to wail on this guy. So, it honestly isn't as bad. Like. It pro we probably took out that health bar of death to get him to run in the same amount of time it would take us to deal with one of the liches if he, he gave us a good pattern. Obviously here we have leap worms. We sprint past. And then we kill them. If we had recoverable health, meaning white health, I would switch to the dwells in light because when you kill leap worms you get a proc of your elemental effect every time. You're weak to elemental effects. Um, this is only relevant for lightning, ice, and, uh, well, I guess it'd be relevant to all of them. But the reason I say it's only really relevant to lightning, ice, and holy uh, is because generally you'll kill them in one hit. Um, lightning, if you kill it, it doesn't matter. It'll still do the chain lightning. Holy, if you kill it, it'll still give you the holy cross. So that's why it doesn't matter for those two. Um... Ice, you can use that to your advantage by, if you don't one-shot them, you can freeze them, and then when you hit them on the next hit, they'll die, and uh, they won't leave their debilitation puddle. That's why that one's particularly valuable. Um, but, like, fire would catch them on fire. But, again, generally, you're going to one-shot them, so it's not as crazy. Also, having them on fire isn't that useful, either. So again, lightning, AoE damage basically. Dark wouldn't be bad if you were weak because it would do the crit very consistently, so you might actually deal extra damage, but I don't know what their debilitation resistances are. I say that size them scares me, but we're okay. This room actually killed me in one of my rooms. Uh didn't have the uh, speed, I guess, to go in and get the casters before they could finish their casts on one of my runs. One of our attempts. So, I'm happy we got them just there. Surprised I didn't go for a Twinter Spin for the freeze. This is gonna hurt. Okay, not as bad as I thought. He came out of that swinging though. Did we get a blood red crystal? Doesn't look like it. Rubicite. I didn't know they could drop that. What the heck? No blood red crystal. No, that's okay. Now, if I wanted to, I could switch to dwells in light. I can kill all the leaf worms on the other side. Oh, it looks like I do. Not bad. I thought I was just switching to it to kill the eight leaf worms on the one side. I decided against. Okay. <laughs> it's only like 16, 17 health per kill. The calculation of how much healing you get off of the holy proc is 10% of your base magic defense. We have probably like 168 base magic defense. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> 
But obviously, every little bit helps, right? Every little bit helps. And then spiders, similar to... Uh, I guess I miscounted during the run. Um, there's eight total. And I think I thought there were only seven just that dropped. But really one dropped, and then four dropped, and then three dropped. So I, I think I just kind of forgot about the one. But anyway, uh, like Leafworm, spiders also get the benefit of being very susceptible to elemental attacks, which means we get health back. Um, the only two that I would ever consider valuable are Lightning and Holy. Holy, obviously, for the healing. Lightning because generally if you hit one spider, you can chain Lightning to the rest of a pack of spiders. Now there, they're kind of spread out, but if they were closer together, we could literally chain lightning to 100% of them. Ow. Not sure why I chose to use the uh, Wells and Light there for a moment. Here I'm jumping. So I'm trying to hit the eye. That combustion hurt. That combustion hurt a lot. We haven't been in the red in a minute, that's for sure. Fortunately, it doesn't take us very long to get our health back. Now here we could choose to use Arc of... We could. We could choose to use Indominal Lash as well. Or Savage Lash, for that matter. But it's not... overly necessary. It doesn't really accomplish anything that normal swings don't. We have the damage from these guys. We only got one holy proc that entire swing set. Feels bad. Uh, next are bats. Bats don't proc elemental effects pretty much ever. Um, so it's kind of... There's no need to keep our Dwells and Light equipped. We should just switch to whatever weapon we're actually planning on using down here. Now, if I kept Dwells and Light, we could have killed the Leafworms on the left over here, but... I don't know. It's Again, it's 17 extra health every time. If I get jumped at by one of them, I'll probably lose all of the health that we claimed, so it's kind of pointless. So there, because we have the Cyclopes configuration up top, we're going to have two Gore Cyclopes down below, one on either side. Each one is accompanied by two Vile Eyes, which is why you see me kind of pulling in this direction. I wanted to... Uh... Unfortunately, the rocks are very difficult for me to avoid. These guys are weak to ice damage. Which is why we whip out the Twinter Bang. Um, they are also weak to slash damage, if I remember correctly. So the Twinter Fang is better damage because of the ice, but worse damage because of the bludgeoning. Um, fortunately, it doesn't really matter. The ice damage is quite good. These guys are constantly standing in water, so we get the value of that as well. If he's standing in a slightly different location, we actually can freeze. Uh, somewhat consistent, like if he keeps getting the damage status. He's not gonna like completely freeze, mind you. He like gets like this instant freeze, instant unfreeze thing that happens. You'll see the damage like be extra large for a tick, and that's it. Uh, but he's not where we need to be for that. It's kind of we can maybe bait him that way, but it's it's not like a huge damage buff.
But yeah, you'll see like his leg or his arm freeze. He, his whole body will never freeze. I've never seen his entire body frozen. But you'll see like his a part of his body get frozen and then he'll break it like instantly. clarify in case you guys were like I've never seen a Cyclops freeze completely me neither <laughs> I'm just talking about his individual limbs yeah see we got a freeze Brock there and it immediately went away because we we broke it ring of desiccation obviously valuable here If you are wearing the Ring of Desiccation before you get drenched, you won't lose. You won't have your light lantern darkened. If you put on, if you get drenched and it puts your lantern out, and then you put on the Ring of Desiccation, you have to put your lantern away and take it back out for it to be like the correct level of brightness. I don't know why. I don't know if that was intended or it's just like a weird bug or feature. <laughs> But that's how it ends up working, for some reason. It is certainly not the worst problem, that's for sure. I do not mind that fact. It rewards you for thinking ahead. Especially if you're in an area where you will likely get drenched. For example, fighting that Cyclops on the other side. Which, it's not that we might get drenched because we'll fall down in the water or walk under the waterfall. There's actually just a couple spots over there that are just deeper and so your lantern will just get wet enough so I want to hit him in the face when I can but ultimately <laughs> I just want to get as many hits in as possible When I hit the face, I do notably better damage. The water here does not have large enough water features to give him the drench status effect to allow us to freeze him more quickly. So, yeah, we're just unlikely to get more than maybe a single freeze proc, maybe two freeze procs off if we keep hitting the legs. But. Either way, it's still, it's decent, consistent damage for very little risk. That was a good hit. That one probably had a freeze proc attached to it somewhere. That move is like nice, but also not nice. It's nice because he maintains a very consistent pattern that if you're on his face, you can climb, but it's also very difficult to get in on the ring. If we were on his, if we were climbing before he did that move, we're very happy because we can just get onto his face and just swing. Hello. Novelty three. At this point, I believe I was still looking for an elite lantern. This, uh, Brightness does not seem large enough to be the Elite Lantern, so that makes sense to me. I don't think we ever got it for this character at all. Not that it matters. Generally, for a no-hit run, I want the Elite Lantern because the bats that were in this room are dangerous, but it doesn't really matter. Fire Artist Game Mercy. This is a run killer. Uh, pretty much every single run you could do in this room is very dangerous. Two dragons at the same time is not fun. Uh, for no greater reason than the fact that their bodies will collide and push each other around, which makes your decision making uh, difficult because you might be in the right position for something and then the dragon gets moved by the other dragon and now you're no longer. Uh, we got the double frost configuration. This is. Honestly, it's probably the best configuration as far as like 
how much damage we can do and how fast we can heal it, but it's also a very hectic configuration. It would probably be better to actually have one of each because it would allow us the opportunity to kill the first fr frost dragon, the frost worm, fairly quickly. But after that, we'd still have to contend with a slower fight of the fire drake. But again, realistically, if we are lucky and we're allowed, we're given opportunities to deal good damage, this fight's it. But as you see, we're taking pretty good damage. Okay, a knockdown's brilliant. We want those, obviously, because we deal extra damage. And indeed, we did like, you know, two and a half, three health bars there. And we had to back off for one of our attacks. We've got that one getting lower. Generally, I will try and focus on one because once one dragon is dead, the second one is extremely easy to kill because we don't have two casters. We don't have two sets of spells we have to consider. We only have one. And if we manage to stagger, uh, we have zero, right? Uh, that being said, I can split damage to them if, if one of them's giving me opportunities but the other one isn't. I can change which one I do damage to. The break point is I don't want to get them below it's like four or five health bars. I think it's below five health bars remaining. Um, so four dots uh, at the top of their, their health bars this situation thingy. The reason for that is at that point they can begin to cast a heal on themselves which will make it so that I don't have the opportunity to, uh, you know, it'll make it so that I have to, I have to deal a fresh set of health to them. When they do cast that heal, it's only three health bars worth of health that they recover, so it's not like they're going to get the full heal or anything. But it is still, I mean, that's still a good amount. If they cast it with five health bars, like I suddenly have, or if they cast it with like four health bars and change, I, I almost have eight health bars I have to go through, right? That's not inconsiderable. That is definitely a good amount of health we have to push our way through. Bolide is a scary spell. You'll see I often go up here to dodge Bolide. That's because Bolide in this room comes through the room at almost parallel to the floor. So even if you are not in the uh, indicator for where Bolide is going to land, it might still just streak through you and hit you, even if you're like 20 feet away from the indicator. Just because again, it'll it'll be like almost parallel to the room, and it's very difficult to tell which direction it's coming from in this room again because it's like parallel. So if you just have your camera at the wrong angle, you genuinely don't see the trail as it approaches, and you just get hit. I have to be a little bit careful. They are both in melee ideas stage, which is uh, dangerous. That's when we're going to have the most colliding bodies and frustrations therein. Uh, but it's also very easy for us to get caught by someone's frost breath if we're paying attention to one and the other one does something. Okay, so that dragon's below five health bars. I, I think it's allowed to heal now. It might be below four health bars. When it's allowed to heal, but I, I genuinely don't recall. We'll see if it tries to heal. We do not have the stability augment. That's a great uh, thing that we got to knock down. Unfortunately, it's like during the other dragon trying to melee us, and so we actually don't get anything out of it. That's the Bastion Augment working for us. Awareness would be a good Augment as well. Awareness is the magic equivalent to Bastion. Yeah, see, he's below four health bars now. He's almost below three. More 
gets to the heart. I don't know what my core core resistance is. I'm willing to bet it's not 100%. But it might be. Generally, I don't have very good resistances because I typically will have more of a cosmetic choice for our gear than a actual stat slash debilitation uh, resistance profile that I'm looking for. Um, obviously, this runs a little bit different. This is not a no-hit. So going for a cosmetic set of armor uh, doesn't really matter. It's also one where I don't have iframes, which makes it difficult. It is, I find it very difficult to stay alive as a fighter without, or as a warrior without iframes. As a fighter, it's not as bad because you can block, right? But no blocking, no iframes, it's, it's very dangerous. We've gotten to the red health a couple times, and that's with good armor and uh, health regen. Obviously, if I was giving myself the opportunity to use curatives, it becomes less of a troublesome moment, but still, I you know, I, I do believe that this game has its challenges, especially in Bitter Black on hard, so I would be I would sound very elitist if I thought that this game didn't have any difficulty. Uh, it certainly does. It's not the hardest game I've ever played. But it does come with its difficulty. And this is a good example of that difficulty, this room specifically. Now, we just killed our first Frostworm for this room, so the second one becomes much easier. I still ran up here to evade the uh, Bolide that he cast. But once we get down, we should be able to do a lot. What's nice is when he's trying to physically attack us, since we don't have a second Drake, it, it becomes one, very easy to evade him, but two, it also becomes uh, very predictable because he doesn't have the second dragon pushing him around and making it so that we get grabbed or we dodge out of the way, but because the other dragon moves him, we dodge back into the way kind of deal. We are jumping here because we want the vertical swing, by the way. It also, yes, lets us attack slightly faster. Most of you want the vertical swing because horizontal swings here end up hitting the elbows a lot. You can get them to work on the heart, but like it's, I don't know, I have a hard time with it. I find finicky. Here we go. But yeah, with that, he's only gotten, what, like, one or two casts off, right? None of them have been overly detrimental. Here's his heal. And it heals him three full health bars whenever he gets a heal off. That's why we didn't want it before, because we were afraid. When we have two dragons, we really want to focus the, sec the one that's low health once it gets to that phase where it can start healing itself, because it can drag out the fight a lot and every time you get it somewhat low it heals itself three health bars. Obviously here though, we're quite happy with the outcome. We managed to kill both dragons and uh, we actually end the fight with 4100 health-ish. That's that's pretty satisfying, especially since the next room can take uh, can have us taking a lot of damage. There are three living armor. Living armor hit us for about 800 apiece. There's also eliminators. Depending on which configuration, there can be eight of them. So we'll just have to see what we get. And since I do not see an eliminator over there, I know that I have the configuration with living armor. You note that I immediately took my lantern off and am standing back here. It's because if I wait, the singular dragon that's in this room, which is a Thunder Wyvern, uh, will eventually roost and will stop flying at us. If I wait long enough and he does, there he goes, and he never notices me, 
which taking your lantern off helps with that. But if he doesn't notice me, I can basically engage the first few living armor solo without uh, interruption. And fortunately, because he roosts inside the uh, courtyard around those buildings, or in between all of those buildings, he actually won't see us until we get pretty close. Uh, the other configuration has two Grancis level wyverns that spawn instead. Not the Thunder Wyverns from Bitter, Bitter Black, but the Grancis level. And they roost on top of the rooftops, so it doesn't take very much for them to notice you, especially if you have your lantern on, so it makes it somewhat frustrating. But this makes it pretty straightforward and easy, fortunately. Now, living armor. Pretty dangerous. However, we can kind of make their AI uh, get stuck in a cycle that we can take advantage of. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, as you see, we can get uh, this guy to jump up when he stops trying to attack me from down below. But we can get this guy to jump up. And when he does that, we can get hits in. I jumped down here. I always try and make the best out of these, but like it's, it's honestly not worth it when we're trying to do the strategy because it just makes it very hectic afterwards. That wasn't a bad one, but now he's probably out of alignment and we have to like get him there. It's a little bit tedious. We'll see what happens. Oh no, wow, he made a quite a good jump. Like I wasn't even expecting it. That's why we're just in the wrong spot and I have to sidestep down here. But fortunately, we got him in the good spot. But basically, we want him to drop off that ledge and then we'll wail on him a little bit. Same thing this way. Now we just broke his armor, so obviously we switched to the Twinter Fang again. Because we want the magic damage in combination with the bludgeoning damage. And if you think about how little damage we're doing on those hits, and consider the fact that those hits are the better hits because we are using bludgeoning. Uh, switching to like a bolt bringer or the dwells in light, like we deal even less damage. So it's uh, these are painfully slow fights. Otherwise, that's why we have Twitcher Bang in our inventory. Otherwise, we would have just carried the dwells in light for the holy damage because that's the only element we specifically need, other than just magic in general. Uh, the fact that this is ice damage is completely irrelevant. But that bludgeoning is of great value. Lantern is going out of oil. There we go. I was going to say, usually I will put oil in that quickly, but. Looked a little slow. This is a much slower fight than uh, obviously we would like. Living armor is kind of like the one thing this run that we just deal bad damage to. There are plenty of things that were slow to kill, but. The magic portion of the living armor is it's painful. Obviously the prisoner door cyclops pretty pretty slow, pretty painful as well. Um Liches, pretty slow, pretty pretty painful. But we actually deal like kind of consistently okay damage to those guys. They just happen to have a lot of health bars or they're fought, they make it so that we can't hit them. This is like an enemy that kind of, we do little damage and we have to keep backing off every time. But we hit them consistently enough so that it's, it's like a combination of the health bar plus we have to back off plus we deal bad damage. It's just a perfect storm of annoying fight. You would think ghosts would be a big problem, but like even ghosts, like we kill in only like a handful of hits in comparison. 
But we should get it like right here. I think. Nice. So there we're using jumping heavy attacks because jumping heavy attacks hit so many times it becomes uh, pretty useful. Now an alternative choice that we could do is try and lure these guys to fall off of the cliff to if we go down these stairs and to the right. It's attainable, it's possible, it's not even that difficult. I am not very good at it. And without having any iframe abilities, it's kind of a risk I don't wish to take. We just lost some 800 health, that one swing that we took. So, as you can see, like there is a bit of a risk involved. I, I don't wish to use it, so. We'll just do this for the time being. And just like the previous one, we pull this guy over here to make him follow the same setup as before. It's not a very fast strategy. But it's very safe and consistent, and that's that's honestly what the the fear is. It's it's the damage that these guys output, and the fact that we don't have a good arena to just fight them. Because I would prefer to just fight them in a better arena, but there really isn't one until the very end of the room, and then at that point, it's just like, why bother? We only have one left. So here I'm using Twinterfang still. I should have switched to the Devil's Nail. We would probably be done already if I had because of just the difference in strength between the two hammers. But for whatever reason, I didn't care to switch. Our damage isn't bad, don't get me wrong, but it's just we don't get much value out of not switching because the moment we transition him to the next hit or to the next phase, which is this one, we, it's not like we get an extra hit in. Usually you would want to switch if you're hitting with like multiple multiple attacking, like like multiple hitting attacks. But we don't want to do that on the transition anyway because he's just going to hit us if we do like a jumping heavy. Because he gets staggered out of being knocked down immediately and then can retaliate. So like we should have just had the Devil's Nail Hammer equipped instead just so that we can breeze through phase one a touch faster but realistically the slow part of this fight is not phase one anyhow so it's kind of it, it becomes irrelevant Curious as to how you get the setup, the uh, with the jumping. It's very easy. You just want to lure him up the stairs a bit until you're like even with this rock. And then you just jump over there, just like that. And you want him to be in line like this. If he's too far down the stairs, he'll slide off to the side like he did last time, where he gets like really far below. Um. As I said before, often it's not that worth going there because it's hard to get up here. He could have easily hit me with that full moon slash. We were just kind of lucky. Go for the consistent damage. There he fell down off to the side because of where we were standing. He can walk, just straight up walk on that rock to his right now, or to his left, our right now, um, that higher one. 
they can just walk up there, so you don't want to use that one. You have to use this lower one. But certain attacks that they use will transition them up the rock for free, like without having to do the jumping stagger or anything like that. So you need to be careful when you're trying to pull this off because it's uh, sometimes the movement the living armor will make can and will uh, more or less catch you off guard because it'll just slide on over. I want to say if, if he does the the sword thrust followed by like the shield bash, that one will often transition him up, up the rock without uh, falling like that. Um, is the way the step works, I guess. I'm trying to remember. There's another ability as well that'll do it. I, I just can't think of it right now. Yeah, you see how he just climbed up with that thrusting uh, shoulder charge? That's exactly what I'm talking about. He'll just take the step as if like he doesn't have to jump. There is another location that we can do this in the courtyard where the dragon roosts that we can use the same strategy on uh, the third living armor in the room. And that's very consistent. It's a lot more consistent than this rock, that's for sure. So it actually makes it a fairly quick fight because of that. So we'll use that one as well. But this this does not make the fight much quicker than if we were using like an open area. The problem is if we don't have access to an open area, that's not going to aggro the dragon uh, until after we kill the dragon. And we don't want to have these guys alive while we're trying to kill the dragon. Because if things get out of hand, we're fighting the dragon and this. Which, generally, we don't have a problem with that, but... We also don't want to run through the entire room, kill the dragon, run all the way back just so that we can lure these guys even further into the room so that we have an arena to fight them in. It's just not satisfying. There we go. That was a tricky last hit for some reason. So here we're switching to Bitter End. Uh, we are going to now engage with the dragon because we can't really attack that third living armor that you can see down below us and ahead of us. We can't attack that without aggroing the dragon. Here, once again, we took our lantern off. That's intentional so that we don't. Uh, it makes you less noticeable. There we swung in the air so that we didn't roll. I didn't want to roll. If you're using a shield, you can also just shield block. Sorcerers can, or mage and sorcerers can just tap levitate for a split second. Yellow vocations can double jump. Everything can attack. In fact, as a mage, I often will heavy attack because you swing the staff. As a sorcerer, I don't tend to heavy attack because you use like a shockwave attack and it stops your momentum. Unfortunately, we don't really knock this guy really easily. And the thing that makes the Thunder Wyvern upsetting is that he always wants to fly into the air. So, you basically have to knock it down and then, and then try and deal damage. The problem is, he is uh, uh, always going to attempt to fly into the air after me knocking down, unless you break the wings. And breaking the wings is just a big, it's a big task, it takes a long time. I'm hitting the head because if we break the horns off, we start doing good damage to the head. Well, I say good damage, we start dealing decent damage to the head. Um, so when he falls down, we can do that. And then, uh, it gives us also a really good ability to stagger him when we break the horns off. And if we stagger him, we get to keep hitting his face like we just were. Fortunately, after you knock him down the first time, it becomes a little bit easier. I think it's once you unlock the heart. Once you make the heart vulnerable. But 
I don't actually know how the mechanic works in that regard. But it does seem that after you've knocked it down the first time and you hit the heart, it becomes really easy to knock it down in comparison. I think the first attempt, it took us like five hits, and then that one took us two. Something like that. You generally want to approach the breath, like the dragon, when you're trying to dodge around the breath. You want to approach the breath that's going in like kind of a curve path. You don't want to run straight at the dragon because it'll often still catch you with its breath. And if it catches you and launches you in the air, one, you'll take a lot of fall damage if you don't fall off the edge. And two, if you fall off the edge, you die. <laughs> Here, at least. So we don't want that. So you'll see I'll take like a curving around to the left or the right. We've chosen left the last two attempts. But uh, we'll take a curving path around the left so we don't run straight into the breath. You can uh, run straight at him and make it in time before you get caught in the breath. It's possible. But... Uh, Every once in a while, while, when I do that strategy, I'll still get caught by the breath and launch. So we just, we don't try. We just go this way. Now, realistically, with the armor I have, I probably have good enough stagger resistance that I can run through that breath. I would be very surprised if I actually get launched by it. But, I'm not used to playing with this much armor. So, I... I'm used to the experience of getting launched almost immediately. Because <laughs> you just lack the stagger resistance. And the knockdown resistance. So here's the uh, location that we can do the other one. It's these stairs right here. You want to lure him to where I'm standing now. We check that just to see if it's a rift crystal. Then you stand up here. And he'll do the same jump. The difference with this one versus the other one is that this is an extremely consistent very, very consistent uh, pattern that will give you. Whereas the unevenness of the rock still often, and the way the, the space is laid out, he'll often like slip down to the side and we have to jump down because we can't really get past him as easily. This one's very straightforward. So we can just wail on this guy as needed. He'll jump down. What's also nice about this uh, this specific you know setup is that one, it's a little fat it's a lot faster actually, because you don't have to worry about weird motions. But two, if you mess it up, it's really easy to get him back into it. Because you just paid him into that one corner. And there's pretty much nowhere else he can go. Sometimes he will like start attacking at you from below without hopping up. If he does that, just back up a little bit higher up the stairs, and a lot of times he'll pop up. Like there, he tried full moon slash. He could still attack other ways. Yeah, see here, he's gonna try and do that. Let's see if he tries another attack, yeah. So here, I'm gonna back all the way up to the top of these stairs, and he should jump. See? Very consistent. Another cool trick is you want to try and time your swing of your attack so that it pushes you up onto that ledge when we jump up. Obviously jumping down, we don't have to clear anything. We don't care how high we jump. But going the other way, if you don't jump high enough, you'll grab onto the ledge if you need to climb onto the ledge that way. It's very silly looking because the ledge is so small. But like that. If you don't jump high enough, you'll do that. So what you want to do is you want to jump and turn your body away so that the momentum of your swing actually lifts you up the ledge like that. And then once you make the landing, you can actually just jump and heavy attack right onto the back of your target. I believe that this area, it's a lot easier to, in my opinion, get hit uh, when doing it correctly. It's a lot easier to get hit even when things are going well uh, in this configure or on this particular uh, manipulation. Whereas the first one that we did on the other side of the uh, city, 
it, if you're doing it correctly, it's very difficult to get hit, just because of the, the terrain difference, the level difference, like the, like how high you are, I mean. But because you're almost sideways neck and neck with him, it's pretty uh, easy for him to get a, a nice hit in on you occasionally here. Unless you're playing very cautious. Um, which I have, obviously I haven't been, but we have a lot of health to play with, so I'm not overly concerned about it. All we have left is uh, three eliminators now that we've killed that one, so like I'm not, I'm not overly concerned. We'll probably bait these eliminators to try and isolate them. Um, that's what I generally do. Uh, this room also has the potential to have death spawn as our carrion beast. I don't know how likely it is that death spawns, mind you. I don't find it overly likely, but he could. Generally, if death spawns, it's either after we've killed everything or right after we kill the dragon. So there I was gonna charge up an arc of obliteration. If we managed to get the charge cast off, I would have, uh, if we had managed to get it off, I would have, uh, Looks like I'm gonna fight these guys here. But anyway, if I had managed to get it off, I would have tried to launch them off the side. But one of them started charging a little bit before I was hoping. I'm a little surprised we actually managed to hit both with that jumping swing. The only thing that's actually scary to us right now is if I get knocked down and one of them stomps on me. Or if I walk too close to the edge and it knocks me off the edge, I guess. That would be the other thing. But if one of them stomps on me, I have to toggle escape. We do not have the aggression augment, so it's actually somewhat difficult to escape before they uh, make it out. And I say somewhat difficult, I find it extremely difficult. I know some people are a lot better at the toggle escape than I am. Um, but I probably only successfully toggle escape out of it, out of the stomp specifically before it, or the before the hammer comes down. I probably only successfully toggle escape like one every ten times. Which is not good enough to be uh, a strategy I'm willing to employ. Uh, with the aggression augment, obviously we get out all the time, but no aggression augment available. If I wanted to get the aggression augment, I would probably get rid of the sinew. Maybe. And wear the sinew boots instead of the, uh... Wear the equipment boots instead of, uh, these. Just have less health regen. Or I could get rid of Bastion. But... I don't think aggression is something we have to worry about too often. This is really the only attack that's a one-shot if we get grabbed. So I would much rather have something like Bastion that's giving us benefit 100% of the time than aggression, which only gives us benefit when we're being grabbed. And uh, we want to avoid that anyway. So we did not kite these guys out like I said I thought we would do. Uh, we just decided that we wanted to mess with this uh, absolute cluster. Obviously we knocked them down very effectively with a single jumping light attack. Uh, we are using that because we know it knocks them down. Um, it swings top to bottom so it's very effective to hit on the head. And it's, it's quite nice. Uh, very consistent. But That's gonna hit us. Ooh, his buddy's corpse uh, blocked him. Nice. But obviously, once we knock him down, jumping heavy to hit multiple times, and we're gonna move on. It sounds like death spawned in. Yep, there it is. I can hear the music now. Uh, as I said before, death is likely to spawn either when we kill the dragon or when we killed everything. Um, in this case, he did spawn when we killed everything. Fortunately, death is not a big concern. I was mostly using jumping light attacks there because I didn't think we'd reach with the heavy because it's kind of high, but I guess we do. Uh, 
I would prefer for him to fight me like up here in the splat area. That way I can kind of egress in a way that I want. Which, uh, he followed me, so that's great. Seeing this damage is, uh, it's a little bittersweet, because on one hand, like, we deal good enough damage, yes, but, like, it's not great. But at the same time, I'm in the middle of a shield-only Mystic Knight run. Uh, there's nothing we can block with our shield as a Mystic Knight that death does, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so we have the Bloody Knuckles, but we leveled 190 levels as a Mystic Knight. So we actually still do zero damage with both Bloody Knuckles equipped. <laughs> we literally just have Bloody Knuckles to deal with uh, Goblin Shamans and uh, Golems, and that's, that's the extent of it. Uh, so I would love to have damage that good. <laughs> oh well. Damon. Uh, Damon, I can't tell if there's any, like, if Damon's weaker to slash or bludgeoning. I assume he's just equal in terms of uh, his resistance to both, uh, which is fine. I don't care. But we switched to the hammer because it just has a higher strength stat than the sword does. Damon is not a fun fight. It's not a fun fight normally as a warrior. As it stands for us right now, uh, we don't have uh, Exodus Slash, so we don't have iframes, so we can't even have uh, some of the other aspects of the fight be fun. So we kind of are stuck with the only strategy that will work in keeping us not getting absolutely beat to a pulp, and that's jumping light attacks. Which I know I said I didn't want to rely on, but honestly, these focused attacks, like, I, I never ever get an attack off the Dark of Obliteration before he knocks me down. And I never get a Savage Lash off because he just uh, either moves out of the way or hits me. Uh, so it's just... This is an un un unfortunate fight. That being said, we will use Arc of Obliteration on him in a bit. So it's not completely boring, I suppose. But it is not a fun fight. Another thing, the jumping light attack allows us access to his head when we jump. That's the main reason why we want to use it. Well, that's not true. The main reason we want to use it is when you jump in light attack or jumping attack in general. Although light attack for warrior for sure. But the jumping light attack, the swing happens in the air. There you see a switch to the arc of obliteration ring. But the swing happens in the air. When your feet hit the ground, you'll basically get to skip all of those recovery frames that you would normally have. And skipping those recovery frames is extremely valuable. Because it lets you, one, move out of the way, which we don't have exit slash, so no iframes. And two, it lets you, uh, after moving out of the way, it lets you uh, get a second attack in faster than you would. So unfortunately, we missed the grab, like, twice. I don't know why. But whatever. But yeah, so here we're gonna climb on his head. We do a lot of damage. The only reason we didn't climb before is I'm not very good at it. Um, and I wanted to get a cool uh, arc of obliteration pop and whatnot. Because we could have staggered him out of it the first time. But let's get the arc of obliteration off. It's dope. Obviously, phase one, a lot easier than phase two in terms of how we deal damage. Phase two, he's kind of too high. He's too high for our jumping light attack to hit his face. None of our other attacks hit his face. So we just live a life of sadness instead. You can climb on him and hit him from the face, or climb on him and hit him in the face on his chest, uh, but you have to deal with the fact that he uses immolation and leaven spells that can hit you. Uh, 
Uh, or you can clip his toenails by just swinging at his feet. So we can, obviously we're not hitting his head, so like the jumping light attack has less value. The reason we go for it instead of the flat land swings is because we just lack the recovery frames. Damon casts too fast. So when Damon casts and we are using like just flat on the ground attacks, it's very often that we get caught by that move right there, the immolate. If he casts immolate and I'm in the middle of swinging a combo, it's hard for me to have to finish my attack, get past the recovery frames, and then run out without taking damage. And because we have Bastion and not Awareness, which Awareness reduces the magic damage we take, Bastion reduces the physical damage. Uh, but because we have Bastion, our physical damage taken is, is pretty good, but... Uh, as in, it's not too troubling, but our magic damage is still going to cook us a lot of the time. So, Immolate becomes pretty much the most dangerous move that he has at the moment. Obviously, we don't want to get hit by a Sizem or a Bolide, although he can't cast those just yet. But, for the most part, Immolate is a massive hit, and it, it just deals so much damage, and it'll catch us on fire in the wake of it. So we're kind of... that That's our big concern. And so we're going to use jumping light attacks for the recovery frames. Because as you can see, like once I hit the ground, like you see how long it took for me to be able to... That was one hit. Because we accidentally didn't jump and we just swung on the ground. And we just That was a great example of what I had just been talking about. About we don't have the recovery frames to run out. But here, because we did a jumping light attack, the moment we hit the ground, we can start running. If we're on the ground and we swing, we have to swing, regain our feet, and then we can start moving. It's just, it's a lot longer before we're allowed to move. That one hit, by the way, took out like, I'm trying to think of how much we went down to. I wasn't paying attention to the number, but we have 4,800 health. Right now we're sitting at 14. So at least 3,500 health from that one MLA. Definitely less than that though, because we've been recovering health for, you know, half a minute, 20 seconds, I don't know. A good while. So it's, uh, it's pretty concerning. That's the first hit we've taken, though, so we're, we're pretty happy with that outcome. Uh, well, we're not happy to take many hits, obviously, but we're happy we're not just, like, hemorrhaging life. Uh, that one hit's an absolute bomb, and we don't want to get hit by it, yes, but we're not playing so poorly we get hit, hit by everything, so assuming I play well, we're okay. Uh, you'll see I ran be behind him during that fire cast. That's because if it was Ingle, Ingle can't be cast behind him. He has to cast Ingle forward in some regard. I don't know if his cone is 180 degrees, it might be 170, who knows. But it has to come out in front of him some way. He can't cast it through his back. Comestion, he can. But Comestion's easy to dodge if we just keep moving. Uh, but Ingle, if I'm at point-blank range and he fires an angle off, I'll just die with this amount of health. Uh, so we just run underneath him to avoid it. Now, if you wanted to go the climbing route, you, like I said before, the dangerous casts are Levin and uh, Immolate. His arm swing sometimes can get you as well. Uh, to avoid immolate, what you want to do is you want to climb up to his like actual head and then jump off right before the immolate like crunch move that he does. These arms will still go out even though we staggered him, so I need to still uh, pay deference to him. But anyway, uh, but you see how he does this crunch right before he does that crunch. If you jump off of his like off of Damon's head, not the chest head, but if you jump off of his head, you can actually outrange it and you can grab back hold. And then for Levin, if you are down kind of where his nose is, you can run across, either across around his shoulders or underneath his armpits. And if you go around in a circle immediately, a lot of times the levens will just cast behind you, like on your path, so you can dodge them. It's not 100% good, but it's probably up there at like 85% accuracy for myself, and I'm bad at climbing, so you guys should be okay. That being said, I don't like climbing. I'm not good at it. 
Uh, I say I don't like climbing. I don't mind climbing. I don't like the mechanics of climbing as they work at the moment. I think in Dragon Sakuma 2 I'll probably enjoy climbing a bit better because I assume them to improve it. But climbing is not my preference. I should really do a climbing run at some point where we just have all of the climbing augments and we just play as a strider and just melt things while climbing. But I don't know. He doesn't sound fun to me. <laughs> it's just not how I play this game. But I'm also the idiot that's here clipping Damon's toenails with his hammer. So, there's that. What do I know? Clearly nothing. <laughs> Alright, he should Soul Vortex here. Damon, in both phase one and two, he can start soul vertexing at about two and a half health bars missing. The closer he gets to three health bars, the more likely he will. And at three health bars missing, he's basically going to do soul vortex, his next attack. He might do one thing first and then soul vortex, but he's going to soul vortex once he's missing three. There, we're missing about two health bars and maybe 80%, maybe a little bit more than that, in fact. So we're pretty confident that if he starts moving, drifting away from us, he's probably going to go to the middle and Soul Vortex. So that's all we're waiting on. I don't remember whether we swapped our ring out. We did not, because we're doing Arc of Deliverance instead of Arc of Obliteration. I don't remember if this is planned or not. Uh, it's been too long since I actually did this run. It's been a few weeks. It's possible we chose Arc of Deliverance because I wanted the double barbed nails. Um, I don't frankly remember. Uh, the fact that I didn't swap tells me that I probably did know that I couldn't use Arc of Obliteration. But, I don't know. I probably could have. Who knows. There I jumped down because I'm not going to mess with it. We have 3,500 health right now. We know that Immolate did at least that much. So, the last thing I want is to be climbing Damon and then have him do his immolate, me not evade it, and then just die. Especially after we've done this entire run without dying or healing. Well, other than the immortal set. So, there's no need to throw it away here. <clears throat> yes, this is a very slow fight. Yes, it's not the most engaging way to fight Damon. But that's what we have. Again, go behind him so that if it's Ingle, it doesn't kill me. Obviously, it's full wide, so it's completely different, but. Here we make distance because if it's Ingle, we can sidestep Ingle. And we were already running that way. Oh my god. That was so far away from us and it just happened to streak through us. I don't know how much health we just had, but it was probably close to 4,000. That was again probably something close to 3,500. So normally, in an actual run, I would use Exodus Slash to evade the arm slashes. But we don't have access to that this playthrough. So we have to just outrun them. To evade them the easiest way, just run straight back. Damon is pretty bad at like hitting you if you just run straight away from him. Here we ran so far because Bolide came out and I thought he would be casting it at me, but he isn't. And so now I'm like on the complete other side of the room and I'm like, oh. <laughs> now I gotta run back.
again, just run away. Now you can actually run straight towards him to evade sometimes as well. I don't know how consistent it is, because I almost always will choose to run away instead of towards him. Here I chose to run away during the commission. I could have easily just run any direction. The reason we chose to run away is because I knew that if he does an arm swipe afterwards, I will wish to run backwards. And if I run forwards while he's casting commission, I can't run backwards because I'll be running into the commission. So there's a lingering fire, which I don't want. So. Unfortunately, we spent too long running away from this man because the uh, misunderstanding of how Bolide was going to come out. But that's okay. Once again, we're completely on the other side of the room. I really don't like that he's in this entryway, by the way. That's uh, pretty much the worst place he could be because we can't get behind him very effectively. And if we do, we're kind of trapping ourselves for a lot of different things. So we don't want that. But it's hard to convince him to come out unless he kind of just does it. Fortunately, there, he did. So, we get to fight him in here again, or out here again. At this time, Bolide and Sizem are the two things that scare me. Uh, Bolide, obviously, we've seen hit me when it wasn't even on top of me as the target. You know, I was a good 20 feet away, it still hit me. Sizem is dangerous because, not because Sizem itself is dangerous, although it is, but it's pretty easy to evade. But Sizem is dangerous because if I fail to avoid a stagger, it's very easy for him to hit me with something else. If he casts full line before Sizem, it's very easy for me to get stuck standing still when the when a full line comes out. Or a commestion, or a leaven even. It's, uh, it's dangerous, but mostly because it's dangerous on the stack. Now, if you're in the air when he casts Sizem, you are not staggered. That's why you see me jumping light attack. Because jump airborne, light attack gives you just a little bit more hang time. thing about Bolide, which I'm not really respecting as much as I should, is when you when you cast Bolide, when anybody casts Bolide for that matter, the first cast of Bolide comes out. You can see that if you notice, obviously, you'll see the angle that Bolide's trajectory, the meteor's trajectory is coming from. The remainder of the meteors for that Bolide cast will all come from the same direction. And more often than not, that cast angle is heading towards the face of the uh, caster, I want to say. But sometimes it feels like it is, so just, just pay attention to where the first one is. The reason that's relevant is if I know that they're all coming from north to south, basically, I am never going to want to dodge to the north because it's just going to keep me in line of the trajectory the bow line is in. But on the side before it's cracked. Which means if the bolide streaks over my head, I might still just get hit by it, simply because I'm in line with it. Whereas if it's coming from north to south, and I dodge south, the bolide will always fall short. Like, it, where's the first bolide coming from? Okay, it's coming from that side of the room. Now all of them are gonna come from that side of the room. If I stay on this side, it's very unlikely that any of them are going to hit me. Just because I'll know which direction they're coming from. That big smack. That was a pretty satisfying thunk on his head. The stagger. The reason we got that stagger actually is because that biting 
move that he has, the grab, it uh, it makes him vulnerable to getting knocked down. So on a ranged location, it's, it becomes very easy to actually stagger him during that move uh, if you hit him during it with a move that has decent stagger buildup. Melee, obviously, not so relevant, but uh, the lingering, the attack kind of lingers after he scoops up, so that's why we were able to take advantage and get a stagger off there, because we can get it during the lingering box, basically, the linger stagger range, the vulnerable range. Now, we're getting Damon back close to being under three health bars. Um, around this point is when he can start to do Soul Vortex again. Because he won't do Soul Vortex again until we get low. Now, I don't recall specifically if it's under three health bars or if it's under two and a half health bars is when he starts to be able to do it. But at about two and a half health bars remaining is when he'll often kind of consider doing Soul Vortex. So my goal right now is just to get him down to a, the next Soul Vortex, because the next Soul Vortex is when I'm allowed to basically take advantage of Damon again and hit him for what I've got. Before that point, I'm still kind of just chipping at this guy's kneecaps and toenail and things like that. So I know... Soul Vortex can come out soon. That's why I'm kind of hanging out around these rocks and I didn't chase him to the other side. So yeah, it looks like at three and a, three health bars remaining is when he'll be able to do it. And then as he moves down to two and a half is when he starts to be more enticed. We haven't quite hit two and a half yet. The hitbox for the drain is actually below his hands where the Soul Vortex itself is. So you, sometimes you'll see... Uh, that it looks like someone's not in line with Damon or the uh, Soul Vortex to line of sight it. It's because you actually don't need to be in line with him, you need to be in line with below his hand where the Vortex itself is. Now that we got that Arc of Obliteration, obviously we're on his face. This is where we're gonna do the big damage, big pumps. Push, push, push. Obviously, there's not a whole lot mechanically we have to do here other than just keep wailing on him. But we get the kill right there. Uh, a pretty sketchy kill, uh, honestly. Like, we almost died to an immolate early. We died almost to that bow lag. We had a couple hits that were pretty, pretty close to devastating. I think at one point we had like some two, three hundred health during Damon's fight, which is pretty scary because uh, he can churn out some good damage. But we got it. Ultimately not a fun fight. Uh, with this setup, it becomes even less acceptable simply because we can't use iframes to dodge the arms. We have to run away from them. But even then, the fight is only slightly faster, frankly. This is not... Warrior is not like the Daemon Slayer unless you're good at climbing, which I am not. But Gloves of Might, Opportunism... Great choices if you're going to be a warrior and fighting Damon. Really, really good. But with that, that's our run. I want to thank you guys for being here. I uh, really appreciate it. If you guys enjoyed the video, uh, be sure to let me know by dropping a like. We do stream these runs live Monday through Friday over at twitch.tv slash localtecobrohe. Hope to see you guys there. Cheers, everyone.